Bronte is the brains behind Jodeci. He is a writer and producer who once travelled to Minnesota to audition for Prince. He didn't get to meet him, but when he got home, he formed the group Jodeci with his brother Dalvin, Casey and Jojo. Jodeci's debut single, Forever My Lady, was a huge success. The group became one of the most iconic R&B groups. While producing Jodeci's legendary albums, he began to work with other artists too. He not only produced for established artists, he wanted to find and raise up new talent. Devonte is behind discovering other legendary R&B artists, Missy Elliott and Timberland to name a couple. While touring with Jodeci, he would hear auditions from local groups and select those he believed had the most talent and potential. Missy was in a girl group called Faze, which was becoming popular in her hometown. She got her group to dress up like female versions of Jodeci and positioned the group to cross paths with Devonte while Jodeci were in town. He was impressed and asked them to join what would become his collective. Both Devonte and his brother Dalvin would go on to recruit acts who would frame R&B and hip hop for decades to come. This included Timberland, Tweet, Magoo, Genuine and Static Major. Genuine also auditioned for Devonte while Jodeci were on the road. Explaining how they met, he said, I had been doing talent shows when I heard Devonte, MC Hammer and Boys to Men were coming here. I made it my business to go and find out where they were staying after the show so I could perform for him. I knew if Devonte saw me, he would see a star. I always had confidence in myself. I knew he would think this kid had something. I found him. I was in the hotel. Getting into the hotel was another long story. I was able to find Devonte when he was downstairs in the ballroom, surrounded by girls. I was just standing there and he kept looking. He just got up and came over to me and asked if I could sing. I told him I could. So he asked to hear me sing. He brought me over to the piano and I started singing the Jodeci song, Stay. All the girls started screaming and stuff. So he grabbed me and took me to meet his manager. He told me he was looking for groups. He was starting a new thing called Swing Mob. He had some groups already, which I found out was Missy and Timberland and all that stuff. A couple of months after, Genuine moved to New York and met Missy and Timberland and the other artists of the Basement Crew. So between 1991 and 92, the Basement Crew was formed. The artists practically lived in the Dejelon Studios located in the basement. Jodeci continued to release albums and tour. Their first album was named Forever My Lady. It was a huge success, going three times platinum. A year after the Swing Mob was formed, Jodeci's Diary of a Mad Band was released. The album featured Timberland and Missy Elliott for the first time. This was their introduction to the music industry on a large scale. They would release their own music two years later. Diary of a Mad Band sold 4 million copies and continued to establish Jodeci's success. And the swing mob were just getting started. However, by Jodeci's third album, The Show, The After Party, The Hotel, cracks began to appear in the swing mob. Some of the members weren't happy. Many would later go on to say they were treated badly by Devonte and that the atmosphere in the studio was toxic at times. In the end, most of the artists walked away. Speculation as to what led to the demise of the swing mob went on for years. Eventually, former members began to speak out. First, they were Susan Weems from the group Sugar. She was in the group with Tweet and Relita. The group recorded many songs and appeared in Devonte's remix video for the song Gin and Juice from the Dangerous Minds soundtrack. However, none of their own songs were ever released, despite being part of the collective for eight long years. Susan gave a lot of insight into what went wrong. The interview was eye-opening to say the least. They were straight out of high school when she and the other girls went to the Father MC concert. Jodeci was doing a show with him. Diddy, who worked for Uptown and was part of Father MC's team, introduced the girls to Devonte. They auditioned for him, singing their tracks, and he was impressed. He stayed in touch and eventually went to Cleveland to speak to their parents to tell them that he wanted to sign the girls. 
they ended up staying at his house in Teaneck, New Jersey. They met the other members of the swing mob, such as Genuine, Faze, whose name would be changed to Sister, and Static Major. Missy was the one to introduce Timberland and Magoo to Devonte, and Melita was already in the collective, and ended up joining Sugar. Then they all moved to Rochester, New York in 1994. It was like a dream come true, being chosen by Devonte like that. And in time, being around Jodeci became more than just excitement because we loved their music or because they were famous. I mean, it became a lot more than that. They were like our brothers. We were like family and they were protective and took care of us. So there was a lot of love there. So yeah, thinking back, it was an awesome feeling. Devonte came up with the name Sugar for the group. The name seemed appropriate because they were all sweet and innocent young girls. While Jodeci was recording the show, the after party, the hotel, at Devonte's house, Tweet ended up coming to Rochester and joining Sugar. One member, Monique, decided to leave, so Tweet took her place. They all saw something special in her. The basement all lived together in Rochester. Player, Sister, Timberland, Genuine, Stevie J, and other local artists. Devonte felt that there were too many distractions in New York City, so he decided it would be better to base the group further out. They moved to Rochester, which was four hours away. As for working with Devonte, Susan said it was really intimidating at first because they were working with a musical genius and a member of Jodeci. One minute we're hearing them on the radio and watching them on TV, and the next we're living with them and working with them. The group witnessed Jodeci making their second album, Diary of a Mad Band, and their third. They got to see Devonte at work, along with the other members of the group. Devonte was the main producer for Sugar, but he had them work with other producers first. They worked with Darryl Pearson. Devonte wanted him to get comfortable and used to recording and being in the studio. Plus, Devonte was super busy with Jodeci and couldn't be around as much. Not only was he producing Jodeci's album, he was doing shows, TV and radio interviews. They also worked with Timberland, Static Major and Dalvin. Stevie J was actually Dalvin and KC's artist from Clowning Records, but he was part of the basement family regardless. Missy and Timberland worked together a lot and had their own particular style, even back then. Susan described being part of the basement like being in music college. It was hard work and the girls had moved away from their families. They worked very hard for go and sleep and rest at times. Susan even described it as an unhealthy lifestyle adopted to make the music dream a reality. It was considered worth it though, and it was a huge learning experience. She summed it up as an amazing experience. The groups vibed together and inspired each other. You know Puffy's making the band? Well, that's exactly what we were, but on a more advanced scale, and way before Puffy did it, she said. There was just so much talent around. People like Darryl Pearson, Chad, Dr. Seuss Elliott, Stevie J, Timberland, Missy, Genuine, and then you got the other groups like us and Player, as well as other Rochester artists. We were all in it together and we were a family. Devonte and Jodeci were like brothers to all of us. Together, just vibed. Everyone was very talented, so the scope of what we could learn from each other was huge. Devonte handpicked all of us and he knew what he was doing when he put everyone together like that. He knew it would work and he knew he could work with each and every one of us we all had something he liked that he could groom further people that could be developed to be exactly the kind of group he wanted to create she said however over the years some of the artists have come forward to describe what they consider to be a hostile working environment and being overworked and exhausted and some have described being mistreated by Devonte, who no doubt was a perfectionist there was even some talk of violence in the studio each of them were grateful for the awesome opportunity to work with Devonte, Jodeci, and very talented artists and producers. They knew Devonte saw something special in them, and boy, he certainly knew how to pick them. Many of the basement artists went on to become some of the greatest names in R&B and hip hop for decades to come. Susan said he recognized that they were all talented in their own way, but that they were artists he could groom further. He gave opportunities to up and coming producers 
who helped develop the singer's sound in his absence. But he also recruited young artists who were just kids and of course, more than likely starstruck by Devonte and the huge presence of Jodeci. Devonte came up with the idea of a collective as being a crew that consisted of all of that. I think he just knew he could make it happen and that it would be very special. He also knew that the collective could be self-sufficient if he wasn't there. Work didn't stop, she said. They were all aware of Devonte's expectations and pulled their strengths together. Everyone had skills to offer to further their objective of dominating the music industry. They were able to create something very different to what was heard in the past and even now. The basement was about vibing off each other and using each other's skills to produce something totally out of this world and different, according to Susan. Sugar were close with the members of Player, as they were like the male version of them, and they were close to Missy, but ultimately, they were all close, especially as they were living together. A great question asked by the interviewer was whether Missy and Timberland's sound was birthed from their time with The Basement and Devonte. She said, yeah, definitely. We really did have a unique sound and style, and that all started from being around Devonte and learning from him and the rest of the talent in the group. All of them had different skills, singing, writing, production, and playing instruments. The group would jam together too, freestyling and ad-libbing, and that's how the sound was created. She said, only the basement artists understand that whole thing because they were all there and feeling it too and we were all working towards the same goals. And that's what the basement was all about and what made us so different to anything else. A family that produced really creative music you could feel and every single one of us were really modelled by that. The conflict between Devonte and Timberland was believed to have arisen from the fact that Timberland was recreating everything he had learned in the basement crew and taking it outside. And Devonte believed that Timberland wasn't giving him any credit for everything he had learned under his mentorship when he was producing for artists like Aaliyah. In his 2015 memoirs, The Emperor of Sound, a memoir, Timberland opened up about his time in the basement and the conflict he had with Devonte. In chapter nine, Diary of a Mad Mentor, Timberland goes into detail about what it was like to work with Devonte. He described working under Devonte as being under house arrest. We would go for days without eating. We would be woken up in the middle of the night to run crazy errands. We were knocked around, kicked around and beat down. He also alleges that he was barely paid royalties for the work he did on various songs during this period. Funny enough, it was Timberland who went on to work with various artists in the basement. Devonte got everyone together, but it was Timberland who ended up working with many of them as Devonte had commitments with Jodeci. And no doubt Timberland was influenced, nurtured and inspired as a member of the collective. But he certainly had his own unique way of crafting his sound. For Genuine's most iconic song, Pony, Timberland came up with the beat and style using degraded records. If you leave a record out in the sun, it will warp. It's going to have a strange distorted sound. I love that sound and I started making beats with that vibe. I was thinking, warp it a little, when I added belching synthesizers to the beat I was working on. In a Drink Champs 2018 interview, Timberland credits Devonte with helping him form the nucleus of his team. When he left the swing mob, he would team up with the former members. He took them under his wing and created some of the biggest R&B hits of all time, shaping the sound of R&B and hip hop over two decades. Devonte actually built my crew, he said. Hmm. So J1, I mean, so Devonte actually built my crew. Think about it. I had Static before Static died. Static Major, who wrote Lollipop for Lil mm. Wayne. <laughs> he wrote Try Again. So Devonte really kind of like. <sighs> it's funny how God worked because Devonte built a crew for himself, but it was actually for me. Wow. Huh. <laughs> when wow. you think about it, because he didn't work with none of them, it was me. Wow. Mm. But he found all the talent for me. Mm. So he found who was the talent? Yeah. Genuine. Genuine. Static. Static major. Missy. Missy. Wow. Um, yeah. 
and it's believed the sound that he created with Alia was very much a signature basement sound. Timberland was a producer on Jodeci's 2015 album, The Past, The Present, The Future. Susan maintains that Timberland and Devonte had their own sound for sure, but that Timberland developed his well-known signature sound after his time in the basement, and that the same could be said for Missy. She said they were all naturally talented people, and it's the same for all artists that fell under the group. It's just that Devonte brought out the best in them and gave them the opportunity and the means to develop their skills, and he really coached them. I'm not saying that Timberland never had his own style and sound that was different from Devonte, or that he stole from Devonte. He did have his own sound, and he came to that camp with that natural ability. It's just that a lot of it was developed from the knowledge gained during the basement era and being around Devonte. I'm talking about Timberland's style, the sound when he first came out and was doing tracks with Alia. That was the kind of thing he was doing back in the basement. We all took a piece of Devonte when we left, she said. You can take the people out of the basement, but you can't take the basement out of the people. So Devonte's style would follow the artists throughout their career. He was a known perfectionist and would not accept mediocre by any means. Artists would be expected to sing lines over and over again until he felt it was perfect. He trained the singers. They didn't just sing their own songs. They had to practice gospel songs, which Devonte would play on the piano. He would arrange the vocals and instruct them on how to sing. When Devonte worked in the studios, he could be there for two to three days, not sleeping while the other artists would fall asleep. They couldn't understand how he had so much energy, staying up and barely eating. The others would feel bad for falling asleep while he was working so hard. Keeping up with Devonte was impossible, according to Susan. He's a genius, a total genius. I've never seen anybody like that or heard of anybody like that in my life. Similar to other great musicians like Prince and D'Angelo, Devonte is also a multi-instrumentalist. Anything he picked up, he could play, Susan said. He taught her how to play guitar. And of course, he was self-taught. He was also known as a phenomenal pianist, playing by ear and coming up with amazing melodies. He really has a God-given talent and was doing what he was born to do. Not only is he an amazing musician, he is a wonderful songwriter, all of which came to him so naturally. Legends have it that Devonte could write a song in one minute. He always had ideas in his head and was always writing. Susan revealed that he wrote the songs for Jodeci's first album, Forever My Lady, when he was just 15 years old. This album was full of lyrics and themes that were well beyond his years. He was believed to be the driving force behind Jodeci. Dalvin also wrote and produced, and Casey and Jojo were the main vocalists, but it was Devonte who had the most of the creative control. The Basement, or Swing Mob, whatever you want to call them, accompanied Jodeci on tour in 1995. At the time, they were touring with Mary J. Blige, an artist working with Puffy. The Basement opened up for Jodeci every night and got a real taste for performing on a large scale. So swing rock, stake your boots. So swing rock, stake your boots. At this point, the artists became anxious to get out there. No longer content, being groomed, they wanted to begin their careers in their own rights. It was at this point that some members began to become dissatisfied with the direction the collective was going in. They couldn't all come out at the same time, but no plan was in place to determine the right course of action for all of them as a collective and individually. The tour sparked their motivation, but when nothing came of it, they became frustrated. Devonte left them behind in Rochester once again to do some work with Sugar Knight and Death Row. That was the final straw for many, and the basement began to crumble. Although Devonte kept in touch, he was gone for a few months. Genuine was the first to leave. Susan believes things became more difficult once he started to deal with Shug. After the tour, record execs saw what the artists could do and the offers started rolling in. They had waited for this opportunity, but their songs were yet to be put out there. They really began to look at their options. Some of these labels straight up told them to leave Devonte. Perhaps around this time, Devonte began to become more possessive over them and seek to keep control of his artists. 
and of course, he began to question the loyalty of some. Many of them decided it was time to do what was best for them and their careers. They started making deals behind Devonte's back. But hey, it was business. I'm sure it wasn't personal. Around this time, Missy decided to leave too. In VH1 Behind the Music, it was revealed that Devonte did have control issues. It was almost like we felt m mentally abused. And Missy witnessed the violent side of him. She said chairs were thrown at her and members of her group, sister. A dog didn't deserve what went on in that room that day. That was the end of her three year run with the basement. She moved to New York City and never looked back. I went through watching my father do this with my mother. I remember telling Timberland that uh, I'm going to leave and I'm never coming back. There, she became a prolific songwriter. In 1997, her debut album was released and she blew up as a solo artist. Ultimately, members of the basement became impatient and started making deals without consulting Devonte. This made him less trusting of them and he questioned their loyalty towards him. At the same time, Devonte was dealing with his own personal issues outside of the basement. He was himself signed to Uptown. He had his own frustrations going on with them. It is believed this was one of the reasons he aligned himself with Shug. Devonte produced No More Pain and Casey and Jojo recorded How Do You Want It for Tupac's debut Death Row album in 1996. Things started getting difficult with him once he started dealing with Shug. That really was the turning point with Devonte as a person. He changed a lot from who we knew him to be and the person we had grown to love. There were control issues. He wanted to have complete control over us because we were like his babies, you know. He didn't want to see that go because he had invested so much time, energy and money in us and into creatively developing us. There was definitely that going on with him. The need to have so much power. It was always his way or the highway. What he said was the law and we didn't have a choice in anything else. And then there were just a lot more arguments and confrontational situations taking place that had never happened before. It just got to the point that the negativity started taking over the happy family that we were for so long and we all started becoming really sad. The fact we couldn't wait forever to see our records out and the bad vibe circulating. It just ended up that people got too tired with it all and broke apart. Sometimes the only thing you can do is to just walk away. Even if you really don't want to, Susan said. At the time it was rumoured that Devonte and the rest of Jodeci were very unhappy with how they were treated at Uptown Records and were considering signing with Suge. Some reports said he became their manager. It is around this time some believe there was a change in Devonte. Susan believed this, saying, quote, Personally, I always felt that once Shook started coming around, Devonte definitely changed. I think that's when everything really started falling apart. There was just a negative vibe that was always around and it just got worse. I don't know if Shook actually became Jodice's manager at the time, though I do think he pretty much was acting like he was. All I know was that whenever Shug came around, there was a negative vibe and all of us noticed that and the change in Devonte's behaviour. I never felt comfortable whenever Shug came around, even though he was nice to us all. He'll talk to us and joke with us and he was protective of us. But hearing the things you hear and knowing the type of person he was, there was always that negative vibe around. It just didn't feel right and we could see that Devonte was changing from that point and his personality suddenly flipped. He just changed into a totally different person that we didn't know. I'm not saying it was Suge's fault. I just feel that Suge was a bad influence on Devonte. The person who he became is not who Devonte really was. He was such a beautiful person with such a good heart and that turned into someone we just couldn't relate to. He did things that he never did before, like lashing out on us and he just seemed increasingly unhappy with us, in general. We never knew why, or what was going on. It could have been something personal he was going through, that he didn't want to discuss. I really don't know. All I know was that he went from being this warm and caring person, 
to someone who was unapproachable and aggressive. And to me, once Suge started coming round was when that started happening. It just wasn't the same with Devonte from that point. Some even blamed Suge for the home invasion that took place in 1993, around the time their third album was being recorded. Devonte escaped within an inch of his life, even biting off the finger of one of the assailants. The intruders broke into his home, stole jewellery and pistol whipped him. The full extent of what he went through is still unknown. This may be the real reason behind his erratic behaviour, although it occurred a couple of years before he even started talking to Suge. It was revealed by the other members of Jodeci that Devonte suffers from anxiety and is unable to fly as a result. While the other members fly, Devonte takes the bus and has missed certain events with the group as a result. There were also reports alleging that Suge tried to cheat Devonte out of production credits, like he did to many of his other artists, allegedly. Devonte was involved in the soundtracks for Above the Rim and Murder Was the Case and some other projects of death row artists. So it's believed that Devonte did change and it was difficult for the basement artists to deal with. They worked long hours without sleep and stopping to eat, day in and day out, yet had nothing to show for it. The music industry is always changing and evolving. Trends come and go and what's hot today may be obsolete tomorrow. It's understandable that they didn't want time to pass them by, missing opportunities or even having their sound become outdated. Although in reality, they produced music that was timeless. Nevertheless, they wanted to get out there and who could blame them? Apparently Sister left before Genuine. Susan claims it was Devonte who sent Sister home because there was too much jealousy. Genuine was the first to leave of his own accord. Then Timberland and Magoo left. Player signed to Def Jam and so did Susan's group, Sugar. One of the terms of agreement was that Devonte would not have 100% creative control over Sugar and Player, which Devonte was totally against. So Sugar decided to stay with Devonte and forgo their deal. This proved to be a huge mistake for their career as they ended up becoming defunct as a group. After years of grinding, perfecting their craft and dealing with challenges, they never released any music. Sugar were the only original basement artist to stick with Devonte. They stayed until 2000. He was devastated that his artists had left, one by one, Susan said. We thought that because of our loyalty, he would put our group out and that's why we stayed with him so long. And that's despite the fact that like Player, we really did want to sign with Def Jam or any other major label who were interested. We wanted to get our records released and be heard because we'd been working for so long. The girls from Sugar felt really bad about the situation. They saw how hurt Devonte was when Player chose Def Jam over him. Despite the deal not giving him full creative control over their music, they decided that they didn't want to put him through that pain again. When Player went to Def Jam, they discovered that the grass wasn't greener. The label didn't give them full creative control either over their own music, as is the case with new artists who sign with big labels. Devonte's influence over their music was no more and they were not the same group under Def Jam. They didn't do as well as they should have. Sugar stuck with Devonte to the bitter end, proving to be the most loyal members of the basement. But at what cost? They had a whole album recorded that was perfected over and over again. It was re-recorded numerous times, but never released. The group had moved three times at this point, Rochester, Charlotte and California. They eventually began to fall out and the pressure, the jealousy and the insecurity began to affect the group. By 2000, Tweet and Susan finally made the decision to leave. It was a difficult moment telling him because we knew he would be really upset, which he was. He was really angry about it because I think he felt that we were ungrateful. I do believe out of the whole crew that he saw Sugar and Player as his babies and that he genuinely loved us. I think that's why it was hardest for both my group and player to leave him. So by the time that both groups left, he was just upset about it as we were. It's just he had a different point of view. Relita chose to stay, and that's when the group broke up. Tweet and Susan never spoke to Devonte again. Susan said Relita and Devonte were allegedly dating during most of the basement era, so that's why she stayed. Relita is believed to have done a solo project, 
but nothing was heard of it since. Tweet joined forces with Missy and Timberland and released her solo albums. Sugar and the other artists must have been very conflicted towards the end of their time in the basement. They were grateful to Devonte and in awe of his talent, but they wanted their own careers and had to decide what opportunity was best for them. Sadly, around 96, 97, Devonte began to become more withdrawn and he didn't make as much music. He almost stopped entirely. Jodeci would not release another album for almost another 20 years. Devonte did do some work with Casey and Jojo when they released albums as a duo. Sugar witnessed him lose his motivation firsthand because they were present when everyone had left. The drive and determination he was known for left and his work became more sporadic. The basement artists understandably wanted to take the opportunities available to them and didn't want to wait around. It's hard when your destiny is in someone else's hands. They simply took control of their careers, even though they all had love and respect for Devonte. Devonte took care of all of them. He housed them, provided and paid for their studio time. He trained and nurtured their talents. So it's understandable that he expected loyalty. It must have hurt when they wanted to sign deals that pushed him out. He probably expected them to turn down any deals that didn't include him, but they left one by one. Devonte's erratic behaviour was also the reason why many left. The end of the Basement crew was a terrible loss in the music industry. Although they did release one song for the Nutty Professor soundtrack, they didn't release any more music as a collective. The artists still went on to achieve success though. They made some of the best music in R&B, hip hop and popular music. Timberland and Stevie J, for example, became legendary producers. Missy, a legendary songwriter too. They impacted the careers of other artists as well as their own. Genuine, Tweet and Static Major all made their mark, as well as countless others. It was nice to see Timberland work with Devonte again on Jodeci's 2015 album too. So the legacy of The Basement and Devonte Swing will continue regardless, especially as they produced music that was timeless and will be enjoyed by fans old and new for years to come. Do you understand why the members of the basement left one by one? Or do you feel more for Devonte? And what do you think about Sugar Knight's influence on Devonte? Do you think it's possible that perhaps he changed when he started hanging around with Death Row and Death Row artists? Thanks for watching. Share your thoughts below. Like, comment and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. And don't forget to click the bell for more.